Well, a major announcement today by NASA that a new form of life has been discovered. Wow, NASA has just found evidence for a new form of life. Well, this announcement came down just a couple hours ago, but for days, the media has been anticipating it and discussing it. Ah, uh, there's a life form. If you're getting your news from me, I want to make sure I cover this. There's a life form based on arsenic. But that also this could be about how NASA has a new way of trying to find extraterrestrial life. There's been great excitement over the last couple of days about arsenic, Lake Mono, and they appear to be able to live using arsenic instead of phosphorus. And that is really quite surprising. Oh, no, sorry. Wait, that was one that I busted about 10 or so years ago. Published in Science, which I was calling bullshit on before the ink was dry. That was then, and this is now. Scientists might have just discovered signs of life on Venus. It feels game-changing. It is so unexpected, but I never thought in my life that it would be something we should either look for or that we would find in Venus. Incredible news has just been announced by a team of astronomers, perhaps one of the most important discoveries in decades. Possible evidence for life has been announced on another planet, Venus. Scientists discovering possible signs of life on Venus. Now, next on Outside Source, we're going to learn how a global team of astronomers have announced they found what could be evidence of life elsewhere, and not on Mars, but on the much more inhospitable Venus. Even though Venus's surface is way too hot for any kind of life, there's this Goldilocks zone in the atmosphere that is not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. And that's exactly where we found phosphine. How surprising was this to you, and how big of a deal is it? Oh, com I'm completely surprised. <laughs> I'm delighted and surprised because it was so easy to just write off Venus as, nah, it's still an interesting planet. But if you want to look for life, let's, over, let's all look to Mars. Of course, it would be thrilling if they were right. And there is life on Venus. But it'd be really strange life because it will be floating in the atmosphere some considerable distance above ground level, perhaps 30 kilometers up. And we concluded that there is no known chemical and physical process that could conceivably produce phosphine. So this adds to the mystery of Venus. And then this opens a very uh, rather bold uh, possibility that there might be something living in the clouds of Venus. But what's really caused excitement is that they've said this could be the sign of life on the planet. Wow, life on Venus, that's amazing. And that was me thinking the uh, rivers of molten lead, <clears throat> not actually rivers of molten lead, might be a problem. But apparently no, there could be floating life in the atmosphere of Venus. My original work had said, if you find phosphine on any terrestrial planet, it can only mean life. And that wasn't an outrageous claim until recently. It's the only way to account for the uh, phosphine that is there in minuscule amounts that was just detected by a, a very fancy telescope. And it's published in Nature Astronomy, which makes it really credible. Except, no, it doesn't even withstand wiki levels of scrutiny. In fact, let me sum up this paper in one simple, unambiguous meme. Aliens. Oh, God, aliens. Your explanation for anything slightly peculiar is aliens, isn't it? Or there is some chemistry that is so unbelievably weird that it could even be life. Aliens? What? What are you talking about, Grease Dane? Which, I've got to admit, isn't just like kind of an unlikely solution. It's billions of times less likely than the things that they debunk in their paper. When in reality, you really don't have to look very hard to actually find a satisfactory explanation for all of this. And that's what this video is about. You lose your keys, it's aliens. A picture falls off the wall, it's aliens. That time we used up a whole bog roll in a day. You thought that was aliens as well? Now, there really aren't that many places in the hall of science where you can get away with speculating that you don't know, therefore aliens, let alone getting it published in a reputable journal. I mean, this really is just not your two away from, I don't know, therefore God. 
Okay, aliens came aboard. Without question. They broke my leg? For some reason. They broke my leg? Right. And then they did a jigsaw? Right. <laughs> well, that's cleared that up then. I mean, the whole thing falls apart and even the most trivial of scrutinies. Even here on Earth, where phosphine can be produced by bacteria, it's almost non-existent. <laughs> that if bacteria were humans, you'd be looking at toenail clippings type levels of excretion of phosphine. The bacteria should be billions of times easier to detect than the toenail clippings. And guess what there's no evidence for? But it gets better than that. The phosphine signature that they detected is minuscule. We're talking about 20 parts per billion. This is nat farting type concentrations. For reference, the human body is about three parts per billion gold. Even with the best instruments, it's just above the noise, which with the, you know, complicated processing that's got to be done on all this, uh, means there's a very real chance here that they might not have actually measured something at all. Seriously, parts per billion, the difference between there being nothing and a few parts per billion is uh, not a lot. Now, it's got to be said that in terms of planetary spectroscopy, I'm probably not near the first man you ought to be talking to about this, but this seems to be what their paper suggests, that these are their two data sets, right? These are the two data sets from which they're concluding that there's phosphine in the atmosphere. And I'm just going to switch back between these two data sets such that you can actually see which is the actual relevant signal in all of this. And the answer is, it's that little bit there at about zero, because it's kind of the same in both data sets. So this is what the actual caption for that figure says. A line feature is considered to be real where the dispersion, the red bar, is low. Only for the candidate pH 3 feature at around zero kilometers per second meet this criteria. So from this minuscule maybe signature, you're going from that to speculating about life. But whatever, science is difficult, really, really difficult, especially when you're measuring parts per billion. So I'm going to give them, you know, tip of the hat just for measuring parts per billion. I mean, just to get the signal to noise down to that level, yeah, it's fairly impressive. So I'm going to assume that they've actually found their phosphine signature. I'm going to give them that one for free. It's probably in the maybe pile, but we're going to give it to them for free. So they then go through and reject a bunch of unlikely sources for phosphine. And <laughs> then go on to propose a, a, a mechanism that is billions of times more unlikely, which they make no attempt, none whatsoever, to discredit, like they try to discredit all of their other explanations. Even though it is the easiest, the absolute easiest thing to rule out on Venus, and I'll show you how. Now, inevitably, when I make a video like this, there's going to be a chorus, and probably a minority chorus of people in the comments below saying, but these people work at MIT, or they're publishing it in the great science journal, and you're just some guy on YouTube using Wikipedia. I think I know who I'm going to believe. Yeah, no, I, I, I go through this stuff every time, and it's even worse with the Elon Musk fans because they go through all the, ah, but he's a, a, a billionaire. <laughs> Therefore, obviously, he's right. Fine. Well, let's defang the you're just some guy on the internet thing first. If credentials help you here, just imagine that I'm a researcher with a long and pretty solid publication track record. You ban just a little bit of a fuse when it comes to either pseudo-scientific bullshit or massively oversold bullshit like this. Let's just put me as someone who knows their way around chemistry, biochemistry, and astronomy. For instance, when Berkeley was pushing their free water from air device, yeah, it's one of the world's top universities. Guess who was there to call bullshit on it? Or when NASA announced their arsenic-based life. Yeah, let's remind ourselves how that worked out. So the central contention here is they discovered an organism that could use arsenic in its DNA instead of phosphorus. And I got bullshit on that 
from the day after their press conference. This is now how it's been followed up. Subsequent independent studies published in 2012 found no detectable arsenate in the DNA of this bacteria, refuted the claim and demonstrated that this bug is simply an arsenate-resistant, phosphate-dependent organism. And under criticism, NASA's announcement of the news conference that will... Well, a mysterious NASA press release sparking major attention. They're holding a press conference this time tomorrow afternoon to announce, quote, an astrobiological finding that will impact the search for evidence of extraterrestrial life. All right, Tom, let me start with you. They're touting this. They're the ones who use the terms extraterrestrial life. What do we expect? Was criticized as sensationalistic and misleading. An editor in New Scientist commented, although the discovery of alien life, if it ever happens, would be one of the biggest stories imaginable, this was light years from that. Enter. Stage left. Phosphine is a signature for life on Venus. So why is this bullshit? Well, the premise of the paper is simple. They found traces of phosphine on Venus. Ah, wow, I hear you say, phosphine on Venus. What the hell's phosphine? Phosphine, the little molecule that might change how we understand life in the universe. Well, phosphine's kind of like ammonia. However, as a general rule, once you get off Earth and just sort of take a broad brush look at the universe, phosphine is kind of what you would expect to see. You see, the universe is mostly made up of hydrogen. It's some 90 atom percent hydrogen. If you have count up all the nuclei in the new universe, 90 percent of them are going to be hydrogen. And it's most visible when it gets into these big balls of plasma. So, I mean, just from the sheer abundance of hydrogen in the universe, you expect most of the compounds that you come across to be hydrides of one sort or another. So oxygen, you expect mostly to find chemically as the hydride of oxygen, which is water, and nitrogen as ammonia, and carbon as methane, and so forth. And that's actually pretty much what you find for the bulk of the solar system, with most of the larger outer planets being mostly hydrogen and helium with a smattering of water, ammonia, and methane. Likewise, you would probably expect that phosphorus would exist mostly as its hydride, which is phosphine. But phosphorus is a bit of an oddball here, because it turns out that phosphine is actually an unstable molecule. Well, under um, sensible conditions. So if you take hydrogen and oxygen under sensible conditions and put a match to it, there is a massive amount of energy released and you get water. And that water ain't turning back into hydrogen and oxygen without you putting a massive amount of energy into the pot. So for every unit number of molecules of water that you make here, you get 285 kilojoules of energy out and that's what's launching the rocket. If you did this with phosphine, you would have to put five kilojoules of energy in to it to actually make it into phosphine. But anyway, whatever. For the large part, you yeah, don't expect to find phosphine in the universe because it's got a shelf life. It falls apart and it doesn't go back together again. So you need an active method of making the stuff if you can see it. Okay, so for the outer planets, they're kind of what you expect to find in the universe. You know, mostly hydrogen and hydrides, that sort of thing. The inner planets are pretty much an exception here in that they're not mostly hydrogen and helium with a smattering of hydrides. The inner planets are mostly gravitationally sorted rocks. Take, for instance, Earth. Most of the dense stuff, which is, you know, iron and nickel, that's all sunk to the center. And the outside is somewhat less dense stuff, which is mostly oxygen. It's mostly the oxides of silicon, sulfur, and phosphorus, which is the silicates, sulfates, and phosphates. Rocks in common parlance. And on top of the rock is the really low-density stuff, like water or the gaseous atmosphere. Now, Earth is a complete oddball here in that life has utterly transformed the atmosphere of the planet to the point where it's got some 20% oxygen, which is something you don't expect to find uh, on a planet like Earth. But if you take a coarse grain look at the surface of Earth, 
it's actually still about 50% hydrogen. I mean, think about it. There's enough water on the planet to cover the Earth to a, yeah, a kilometer or so with water. And water is some 66-ish percent hydrogen, you know, by number of atoms. And the entire of the atmosphere is, you know, if you were to liquefy it, is only equal to about 10-ish meters of liquid. And that basically has zero hydrogen in it. So the surface of the Earth is some um, 50-ish percent hydrogen, which you'll also be stunned to find out is almost the same as your composition by atoms. You know, if you take a look at what you're made of, it's, um, I don't know, 60, 80 percent water or something, which is mostly hydrogen. And then there are some biomolecules in there, which again are you know, 50 plus percent hydrogen. And this is all life on Earth, by the way, all of it. The uh, extremophiles, you know, these these bacteria that can live in hot water or acidic water, they all live in water. <laughs> They're all some 60-odd percent hydrogen. And this includes the organisms on Earth that excrete phosphine. Phosphine is associated with microbial life. It's found in oxygen-free environments, such as wetlands and swamps and sludges. It's associated with feces, so we know for sure that phosphine is associated with life here on Earth. So maybe that's the origin of phosphine on Venus, right? I mean, we get phosphine in swamp gas, so maybe it comes from some of the same organism. So a lot of my work was going, oh, if this life on Earth produces phosphine, could other non-oxygen loving alien life produce it too? Yeah, yeah, I mean the slight problem here isn't really so much of a slight problem. There is no hydrogen on Venus. Essentially of any sort. I mean let's just take the atmosphere of Venus, shall we? It's some ninety-six and a half odd percent carbon dioxide. No hydrogen there. Three and a half percent nitrogen. Again, no hydrogen. 150 parts per million sulfur dioxide, no hydrogen. 70 parts per million argon. And then, yeah, finally, we get down to something that has some hydrogen in. 20 parts per million water. Hell, let's just transpose that into humidity. Yeah, just for a laugh. 100% humidity here on Earth constitutes about 2% of the atmosphere. That is... 20 parts per thousand or 20,000 parts per million. On Venus, it's about 20 parts per million. The relative humidity is about one part in a thousand. I won't bore you with the details. Needless to say, there are no parts in the Venus atmosphere where you are going to condense liquid water. Even though Venus's surface is way too hot for any kind of life, there's this Goldilocks zone in the atmosphere that is not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. And that's exactly where we found phosphine. Oh boy, look, an oven can be at the exact right temperature for cooking a cake. It can be right bang in the middle of the Goldilocks zone for cooking a cake. But unless the ingredients are there for cooking a cake, you're not gonna get a cake. Now, sure, you might be saying that I can detect the slightest whiff of cake smell. But the mere fact that there's nothing in the oven means proposing that it's coming from a cake in the oven is kind of a stretch. There are no ingredients for life on Venus. And no, you can't really just fob this off as one of those life as we know it type things. Because with a bit of understanding of chemistry, you start to realize you're really pretty limited on the chemistry that can do this sort of thing. It's basically going to have to be water or a molecule very similar to water and hydrocarbons. None of these ingredients are present in significant quantities on Venus. Look, let's just put this in the context of the driest place on Earth, the Atacama Desert. And even that rolls along at some 20% relative humidity. If you were to take the Venus atmosphere and put it there, you would have 100 times less water in the air. Something tells me you're not going to get much swamp gas off the Atacama Desert. So there's no liquid water on Venus. None whatsoever. 
Hell, there's no hydrogen on Venus. And what do you need for life? Oh, about 50% hydrogen. Such as wetlands and swamps and sludges. It's associated with feces. So we know for sure that phosphine is associated with life here on Earth. So uh, let, let me just put this on a sort of chart here, you know, up at the top here. You've got some possible explanations as to why there's phosphine on Venus. Like there are angels who are putting it there or God or the flying spaghetti monster. You know, the usual place map for us for, I don't know. Then we come to the massively unlikely stuff like uh, like somehow a planet with no hydrogen has managed to accumulate all of that hydrogen into water, which is somehow floating in the atmosphere without raining out. And then it's making life in the atmosphere, which somehow isn't either cooked by the temperature, frozen by the cold or rained out and manages to suspend itself in the cloud somehow. Then we come down to something a little more plausible, like there are aliens who dump their phosphine powered rockets on Venus. And then we get down to the stuff that's actually plausible. Now it's got to be said at this point that no one really knows a lot about the surface of Venus, other than it's likely to be a rock very similar to Earth. That is, the outside of Venus is mostly going to be the oxides of silicon and aluminium, and when it's around, phosphorus is the phosphate. But there's a thing, oxides of phosphorus are stable. They're essentially rocks. <laughs> Even if you react it with water, it's not going to do a lot. You're not going to get a lot of phosphine given off that because basically phosphorus and oxygen really like sticking together. So you need an energy pump of some sort. Now you get these things all over planets. Possible sources are things like geological energy or maybe lightning. Now the paper goes into some lengths to say why it couldn't be lightning. Now, it turns out lightning is actually sort of fairly controversial on Venus. There's some things that say maybe yeah, some things that say maybe no. But it's likely that there's both lightning and volcanism on Venus. You know, things that could be a sensible energy pump here. Now, the paper goes into some lengths to say why it couldn't be lightning. You know, and that if you get a lightning bolt and it atomizes everything within that lightning bolt and then they just recombine, eh, you would get some phosphine in there if there was some phosphorus and some hydrogen you know, in the bit where the lightning bolt goes. But they go in to do this great calculation to show that, you know, if you were to get loads of lightning, you wouldn't get any sensible phosphine for <laughs> two obvious reasons. There's almost no hydrogen in the atmosphere. There's almost no phosphorus in the atmosphere. Except, no. Lightning bolts hit the ground too. And when they do, they make a mess. You get these mineral structures called fulgurites. Now, let's see what Wiki has to say about fulgurite, shall we? Wow, wow, guess what you get if a lightning bolt hits phosphate-rich rocks? You get things like phosphite. And if you don't like things being on Wikipedia, you can always go that one extra click and find the link to Nature Geoscience. Now, why is any of this relevant? Well, guess what you get if you mix almost any crap that contains hydrogen, whether it's, you know, water or sulfuric acid or whatever, with a phosphite, especially if it's hot, you know, sort of surface of Venus type temperatures. Why? You get phosphine. And we concluded that there is no known chemical and physical process that could conceivably produce phosphine. <laughs> oh, really, boys? It took me an afternoon on Wikipedia. Yeah, it, it's not quite so much that there is no known mechanism. It's that you couldn't think of a mechanism. And let's see the conclusion that you come to because you couldn't think of a mechanism. So this adds to the mystery of Venus. And then this opens a very uh, rather bold uh, possibility that there might be something living in the clouds of Venus. But let's be fair. Is my explanation for phosphine on Venus perfect? No. Kind of difficult to come up with these things when you don't actually know what the composition of the rocks on the surface of Venus are. But on the Occam's razor scale, this is billions of times a more likely explanation for phosphine on Venus, assuming it's there of course, than floating water-based life in the atmosphere. Cool, so let's see how they summarized all of this in their paper. Phosphine and the Hypothesis of Venusian Life. In the supplementary information, we briefly summarized ideas of why the temperate but hyperacidic Venusian clouds have been proposed for decades 
as potentially habitable despite obvious difficulties such as resisting destruction by sulfuric acid. Oh boy, have these folks even been awake? None of the building blocks of life are present there. There's no water present. And you're drawing analogies to this to swamp life. These are all things you have to worry about long before you worry about the uh, acidity of the atmosphere. But now that you mention it, yeah, proteins fall apart in these sorts of acidities. And that's assuming the building blocks of life are even present in the first place. So even assuming the building blocks of life are present, which they're not, they would rapidly dissolve in these sorts of acidities. We earlier proposed in a Nature Astronomy article that any detectable phosphine found in the atmosphere of a rocky planet is a promising sign of life and showed that biologically produced phosphine is favored by cool acidic conditions. My original work had said, if you find phosphine on any terrestrial planet, it can only mean life. And that wasn't an outrageous claim until recently. When you showed this to be categorically wrong, seriously, if they had to put 1% of their effort into trying to discredit life as a source of the phosphine here, just like they put all of this effort in trying to discredit all other possible explanations, they would have had a list a hundred times longer. But for some reason, you went around with the exact opposite conclusion. You went around telling everyone that phosphine was a good indicator of life, and therefore phosphine on Venus was a good indicator of life. All based apparently on the lack of imagination of this young scientist. She's convinced that anything that can survive this intense arsenic bath would have to be structurally different, would have unique DNA fundamentally separate from life as we know it. Oh, sorry, I could have mixed up for a moment there. All based on the lack of imagination and experience of this young scientist. My original work had said, if you find phosphine on any terrestrial planet, it can only mean life. And that wasn't an outrageous claim until recently. I mean, it really is. When they're trying to discredit other methods by which phosphine might be produced, they're all like this. They just can't get enough of it. And then when it comes to maybe applying that same level of scrutiny to say maybe disproving life as a potential source, uh, they all of a sudden turn in to this. And that is how the flimsiest data bolstered by outrageous claims combined with scientific journalism that can't work out that life needs water ends up with this. Incredible news has just been announced by a team of astronomers, perhaps one of the most important discoveries in decades. Possible evidence for life has been announced on another planet, Venus. Now, the sad reality is I'm feeling pretty much like a voice in the wilderness in this one, in that I've seen no other videos, including some videos from some pretty reasonable scientists who actually call out the obvious deficiencies of these claims. And in many cases, the videos that you see getting all the traction gloss completely over that for the more clickworthy titles of things like, did we just find life on Venus? But hey, that's what this channel's always been about. Ugly truths over fragrant bullshit. And in this particular case, very, very fragrant bullshit. It's associated with feces, so we know for sure that phosphine is associated with life here on Earth. So if you enjoyed that, give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you don't want to miss out on more great videos like this one and as ever. If you really like this channel and want to support it directly, you can do it through Patreon. Um, and uh, thanks for watching.